Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. Hi and welcome to Destination Michigan, where we explore the beauty, creativity, and destinations in our Great Lakes State. Tonight we're going to meet some outstanding Michiganders, and we'll travel across the mittens to visit the communities that make Michigan unique. Here's a glimpse of tonight's travels on Destination Michigan. Coming up, we take you on a tour of the Gerald R. Ford Museum in Grand Rapids, where the late president's legacy lives on. Next, we're heading north to McMillan to view the woods in the wintertime in one of the best possible ways with help from sled dogs like Snickers. <laughs> then we get swept up in curling and we'll show you why it rocks. And are setting sail, but not in the traditional sense. We're heading out on some ice boats. Plus we're headed to the Detroit City Distillery in the Motor City. You don't need to travel all the way to Washington, D.C. if you want to learn about the history of President Ford. So to begin our journey tonight, we're going to Grand Rapids. Destination Michigan's Stephanie Mills takes us on a tour of the Gerald R. Ford Museum. President Gerald R. Ford is the only man from Michigan to ever become the leader of the free world. Here, you get the chance to not only learn about his time in office, but also find out about his early beginnings. President Ford has a very unique history in that he was actually born Leslie Lynch King Jr. But his natural father was very abusive to his mother. She left him in Omaha, Nebraska, and she moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where she met Gerald R. Ford, a paint salesman. President Ford only really knew uh, Michigan and Grand Rapids growing up. He rose up through uh, colleges. Uh, he was an outstanding football player. He went into the service during World War II, came back, decided to run for Congress, and he was tapped to replace Spiro Agnew, who resigned as vice president and, and became president after the resignation of Richard Nixon. Learning about President Ford's rise to the nation's top office is just one of the many things you discover and watch unfold at the Gerald R. Ford Museum in downtown Grand Rapids. The museum opened in 1981. We've been open ever since. Every president since Herbert Hoover has had their own presidential library. And it was all built with private funds, no government money whatsoever. When you begin your tour here, you find yourself on a trip through one of America's most fascinating times in history. Gerald Ford, his presidency is a chapter. It is also a reflection of how the Constitution works, where a man who was not elected to either vice presidency or the presidency became president through the Constitution. It wasn't an accidental presidency. This was all spelled out in the Constitution. So I think it's a great lesson in civics in how our government operates. The museum also has a section dedicated to First Lady Betty Ford and her many causes, including breast cancer and drug dependency, along with several other must-see exhibits. Right now, we're inside the Ford Cabinet Room. It's almost an exact replica of the Cabinet Room at the White House during President Ford's time in office. People can work with an interactive table to select one of three uh, situations on how they would choose to make a decision. One being, do we give a pardon to Richard Nixon or do we bail out New York City or what do we do with the fall of Saigon? The other big draw here is this exact replica of President Ford's Oval Office at the White House. 
you can really picture yourself inside the office and you can get to hear from the president on various nice recordings that play all around you. We have a lot of audio visual throughout the museum, a lot of it in President Ford's own words. I see new generations of concerned and courageous Americans. But there's also an interactive display. There's one where you can select a room in the White House, learn the entire history about that room in the White House, and also how it was used during President Ford's administration such as the East Room where he was sworn in. And then also that's where Susan Ford had her uh, senior prom in high school. During our tour, the museum featured a temporary exhibit dedicated to American aircraft carriers. It showcased materials used from the christening of the USS Gerald R. Ford, the newest aircraft carrier. So whether it's the past, the present, or the future of the president's legacy, you'll discover it all at the Gerald R. Ford Museum. We are a national museum, it just so happens to be in Grand Rapids, and that's exactly what we are. Sometimes we overlook what's in our backyard, but uh, I really hope that people will always come here to the Ford Museum because it really is a national destination. While the Gerald R. Ford Museum is in Grand Rapids, the Gerald R. Ford Library is in Ann Arbor. To learn more about both, head to their website, FordLibraryMuseum.gov. Well, we're all familiar with the Iditarod, an approximately 1,000-mile sled dog race across Alaska. Well, Michigander Ed Steelster has finished that race seven times. And along with his wife, Tasha, they own Nature's Kennel Sled Dog Adventures, where they take guests on tours. We spent the afternoon with Tasha and their team of guides and sled dogs at their kennel north of the bridge in McMillan. Do you dream of being a musher, of driving a sled dog team through trails covered with freshly fallen snow, cozy under your winter gear with a slight breeze on your face, enjoying the sounds of nature and maybe a bark or two? Well, that dream can come true with a tour from Nature's Kennel Sled Dog Adventures. 135 Alaskan Huskies await your arrival, ready to run, and ready to take you on an experience you'll never forget. Most people want to learn to drive their own team. I mean, it's kind of on a bucket list thing. People, children have to be 10 years old to drive their own team, all the way up to, I've had my oldest client driving their own team was 78. If people aren't comfortable driving their own, of course they can take a ride in the sled, which we certainly do that, and we call those like riders and drivers. Yes, you heard that right. You can drive your own team or be a rider in a sled at Nature's Kennel. They offer half-day trips, full-day trips, and overnight trips for guests too, right from their kennel in the UP town of McMillan. Our half-day trip is 10-mile trail. Our full-day trip is 20 miles. And then our overnight trip, they do 20 miles each day. They do 20 miles to camp, and then we have a big bonfire, we have dinner at camp, uh, breakfast at camp. The, the dogs stay with the guests at camp, so they kind of get the experience of feeding and caring for the dogs. And then they do 20 miles out and are done around noon the next day. It is a heated winter tent. It's winter camping with a guide and in a guided situation. And they can tell their friends they winter camped in the UP. So that just kind of adds a new dimension, but those are pretty popular trips as well. They're just a one night camp. While they tend to keep their trips pretty personal and small at Nature's Kennel, they have larger groups visit as well, as they can accommodate about 15 people at one time on the trails. We groom and maintain all of our own trails. Uh, we have 50 acres of land, but the majority of what we run on is state of Michigan property, and we upkeep and groom those trails. Just pretty scenic and wooded trails. People get an off-road experience through the Upper Peninsula. I mean, pretty typical topography of what's here in the UP. A little bit of rolling gentle hills, um, deep snow. We get a tremendous amount of snow here, so snow is never an issue. We run trips from early December through mid-April. And the trips are guided by owners Ed or Tasha Steelstra, or by one of their guides who have traveled from around the state, country, and world to help out. This year, one is from New Zealand, um, one girl from Ohio, Virginia, and Michigan. So, and that's pretty typical. Our staff is pretty diverse. Uh, we have a few college interns that come through each year as well. So I usually have an intern each, each part of the season. And so, yeah, kind of a lot of hands-on for a lot of dogs. Now, on to the details about these super socialized sled dogs, because it's really the help from them that allows guests to view the woods in the wintertime in one of the best possible ways. 
They are all Alaskan Huskies, which is not a registered purebred breed. It's a recognized breed. If you say we have Alaskan Huskies, people know what that is. Most people come here expecting to see a Siberian or a Malamute, great big fluffy dog. Those are registered breed dogs. There's very few purebred Siberian kennels what I would consider competitive racing or even touring kennels. The dogs are just, a, they're a little slower, a little more stubborn, a little harder to train. We can let all of our dogs run loose when they get done running and they don't run away. Alaskan Huskies are a little more people oriented, love to know what's going on, love to be in each other's business, but they just won't take off. At about eight months old, we put a puppy in the team with a small team with adults and they know how to pull. There's no teaching we have to do for them to teach them to pull. You can kind of hear them, they act as a pack, they sing like a pack, they're very pack-oriented dogs. They howl and sing when it's close to dinner time and when they hear something in the woods. Before Nature's Kennel Sled Dog Adventures, Tasha was a teacher. Using her educational background and love for mushing, she travels to schools and visits community organizations when there isn't snow in Michigan to teach the importance of teamwork and respect through sled dogs' perspectives. Kids are fascinated by dogs. They love the sled dogs. We take a couple of them into the school, so we instantly have their attention. Um, and it's a pretty interactive presentation that we do. And we do those all over the country. So we talk about being safe and kind and responsible, not only in the classroom, but also when working with 135 sled dogs and how that looks and works. And the Nature's Kennel team sure does take great care of their dogs. Both Ed and Tasha have won numerous humanitarian awards for the excellent care they provide the pups. We like to think that we're taking the best care of them we can because they are, they are truly our employees <laughs> and our pets and part of the family, yeah. Around se eight, seven, eight years old, I'm really starting to look at how long the dog has to be able to be running at the level we want them, even if it's on tours. Um, we're asking a lot of the dogs, they're running five or six, seven days a week in the winter time. If I notice they're just not as excited to run anymore, then I retire them into family homes. They make great family pets. They house train really easily. So we've got retired dogs that live all over the country. And there's some younger ones who are not this, you know, they haven't quite figured out to be a sled dog and they also move to family homes as well. They love and live to run, yes. To guide the dogs on their runs through the trails, drivers say G to turn right, Ha to turn left, easy to slow down, and whoa to stop. But the one word you won't hear on a tour or at a race is mush. Mushers never say mush. So we go mushing. You could be a musher, but you never say mush. We, mush, we say let's go or a hike, hop, something a little quicker. Yeah, if you go to a race and say mush, people are going to laugh at you. Nature's Kennel Sled Dog Adventures provides boots and mittens at no extra cost to keep their guests comfortable in the cold. And although most of their tours are out of their kennel in McMillan, where there's often snow, they do rides at Boyne Highlands Resort and Tequamanon Falls State Park, too. To learn more, their website is natureskennel.com. Now, curling didn't become an official Olympic sport until the 1998 Winter Games, but it became a hit in places like Midland long before curlers won medals. Our Stephanie Mills got a crash course in the sport, and as you'll see, it's a lot harder than it looks. More and more people are getting into curling. It's a really fun sport, and it's easy to see why. I curl because it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, good exercise. It's a uh, Good way to socialize with friends. Fun. It's a word you're going to hear a lot over the next few minutes as we take you inside the awesome world of curling here in Midland, home to one of just three curling clubs in the state. Curling's been here for, I think we're at 52 years. It started back in the 60s. It was brought to Midland by some Dow Chemical scientists who were also Canadians. And they ended up kind of starting it as an outdoor rink. Over the years, the original club grew, but it wasn't until 2008 when this facility was built, thanks in part to the community center, that things really took off for the Midland Curling Club. We were a club of anywhere from 100 to 150 members for a, a lot of those 50 years, and now we've gone from 100 and some odd to almost 300 members just in the last six years. 
Today, members young and old aren't afraid to get swept up in the sport. As long as you're big enough to pick up the 42 pound rock, you're good to go. It's a game that's easy to learn, but like my dad always says, it's a game that's very hard to master. So you spend a lifetime, you, spend, you learn it pretty quickly, but then you spend the rest of your life trying to master all the nuances and the techniques and everything. Curling is a lot like shuffleboard, but on ice, of course. Two teams consisting of four players take turns sliding the large granite rocks across the ice toward the circular pattern on the other end called the house. The sweepers try and steer the rock in a direction. Rocks closest to the center of the circle get the most points. It's mostly just dedication. The movement itself is not incredibly intricate or detailed. You need a little bit of balance, but you can develop balance. And you need an instructor, help somebody else, and then you just need to throw rocks. Easy enough, right? After Coach Graves talked me through the basics like putting my left foot on the slider, crouching down to slide off, it was time to see how coordinated I was in getting the rock down this perfectly flat ice. It's just a matter of where are you trying to get the rock. A few more lessons and I may actually land a rock in the right house. Sweeping is also no easy feat. My triceps were feeling it the next day and yet I could really see myself getting into the sport. It's a lot of fun and a really good workout. Players walk an average of three miles per game. It's a social game, it really is. You have a lot of interaction with a lot of great people. I have never met a curler I did not like. It just seems to be, brings out the best of people, the sport. The Midland Curling Club has many different leagues, including one for kids and teenagers. They travel all over, including into Canada. But you don't need to be young to do the sport. It really is fun for anyone. It's a game that you can do for your entire life. The people that it attracts are just great people. It doesn't matter where you go. If you can find a curling club, go in a curling club and you'll be welcome. They're just really good people. They're there for the right reasons and they're there to have fun. You get out, you enjoy uh, the game, you enjoy the competition. Everybody congratulates each other's good shots. So the courtesy in the game is similar to golf, another Scottish game. So it makes it fun for everybody. The Midlands Curling Club's website is a great source of information if you want to find out more about the sport or want to join one of their leagues. Well, there's a small handful of yacht clubs in Michigan that are dedicated to the sport of sailing on ice. Next, we're headed to the western side of our Great Lakes state to visit with one of them, the West Michigan Ice Yacht Club in Muskegon, to learn about ice boating. There is something about harnessing this little bit of wind here and turning that into 20, 30, 40, 50 miles per hour of speed over the ice. Just flying over the ice, just a few inches above the surface of the ice, making a turn, coming out of a hike and feeling the acceleration, is, it's exhilarating. It's just, uh, it's just wonderful. Tim Fry has been ice boating for the pure enjoyment of the experience since his dad took him out on his first ride at five or six years old. Forty-some years later, he's still sailing and encourages others to, as the Vice Commodore of the West Michigan Ice Yacht Club. The Muskegon Club was originally established by a gentleman smitten with sailing on ice over 60 years ago. These days, the dedication to ice boating remains. Ice scouters report on region conditions and gather members together for a day or weekend out on a lake in the area. There are around 90 members of the club right now, of which 70 have boats like these. Well, a very popular boat is the DN. These are the smaller boats out here. I think it's nice because it's a light little boat. You can put it on your car, you can uh, pick it up. One person can set it up, one person can take it down. It's nice, easy that way. This is a knight. The knight has the end with the little bar through it and that's a very tight class. You can't make any changes. The weight is regulated, the dimensions, the sail size, etc. It comfortably sails at 40 to 60 miles per hour without too much effort. The Skeeter boats, which are the, the very large boats, their only limit is 75 square feet of sail. There are lots of variations. The bigger boats generally go a little faster. I can't tell you what the record is, but I think it's well over 100 miles per hour. Now, of course, you have to have excellent conditions to experience record-breaking speeds, but these hardwater sailors certainly can come close. Softwater sailing is uh, a lot of the same physics, but 
when we ice boat, we sail off the wind that we make by moving forward across the ice. So yeah, that's where the speed comes from. Some writers say that we can sail five times the speed of the wind. I think perhaps more realistically, it's three to four times the speed of the wind. So 10 knot wind might get you 40 knots of speed. Tim says the ideal speed of wind to go out in is 10 to 20 knots, or roughly 11 and a half to 23 miles per hour. It costs no energy, and you can do it over and over and over and over, and once you've established your boat and your equipment, there's no further expense for it. And when it comes to equipment, the West Michigan Ice Yacht Club is firm on sailing smart and safe. That means having helmets, goggles, ice picks, and grippers on your boots. Safety is just as important for leisurely sails as it is for racing, which many of the club's members do. They race in championship regattas across the world, and sometimes even in their own backyards. We call them scrub races when a few guys get together. If the wind is right, we'll put some cones out, someone will start the race, and we'll just kind of all race and see who's the fastest. No trophies or anything like that. When we start a race, we'll start a straight line. The ice boats race upwind and downwind. We start out downwind, everybody starts out sailing upwind. Half the boats will go to the right at a 45 degree angle and the other half will go to the left at a 45 degree angle. The person starting the race just puts their arms up when they drop their arms, we go. I think anytime there are two ice boats on the ice, there's a race going on. It's one of those sports that when it's available, when you can do it, you have to get out there and do it. And, and once you get hooked, my feeling is it's an addiction. And if you're going to have an addiction, take care of it. <laughs> so go sailing. <laughs>
with cocktails, and it's just something that uh, I fell in love with. So here I am years later. Do you partake of the stuff yourself? Uh, on occasion. Yeah? Your favorite? Uh, right now I'm, I'm drinking a lot, a lot of the Bloodline whiskey. Uh, we're trying to develop a lot more cocktails with it as well. Uh, it's kind of a unique flavor. It's uh, got a lot of wheat to it, so it's a little sweet. It has some Irish whiskey characteristics. What's the hometown favorite? Yeah, uh, bourbon would be the most sold. It's it's super popular right now. You know, it, all over the country, all over the world. Saturdays uh, during our e the Eastern Market uh, hours, we sell a lot more vodka, uh, especially our Bloody Marys. Um, a lot of vodka cocktails as well. Well, I'll tell you what, my old Irish relatives say. They'd love to be here to have a taste of it, so I'll have to do that for them. I think that's a great idea. Make sure to check out DetroitCityDistillery.com for information about their spirits and cocktails. Well, now we'll conclude our episode with some Destination Michigan trivia for you. At one point, the heart of the mid-Michigan town Durand was the train depot. Durand Union Station was built in the early 1900s. When the depot was at its peak, how many trains passed through daily? Stay tuned for the answer. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. Our Destination Michigan trivia question for the night. How many trains passed through the Durand Union Station daily in the early 1900s? The answer is 142 trains. 78 freight trains, 42 passenger trains, and 22 mail trains handled approximately 3,000 passengers a day. Today, the Durand Union Station is now an educational source of Michigan's rich railroad history, hosting a museum and collection of archives. Well, thanks for joining us tonight on Destination Michigan. We hope you'll tune in again and learn more about the state we all love to call home.